Lots of families are as bad as mine in that. Retty's family were once large landowners, and so were dairymen billets. And the Debbie houses, who are now carters, were once the Debaya family. You find such as I everywhere. Tis a feature of our country, and I can't help it." So much worse for the country. She took these reproaches in their bulk simply, not in their particulars. He did not love her as he had loved her hitherto, and to all else she was indifferent. They wandered on again in silence. It was said afterwards that a cottager of Wellbridge, who went out late that night for a doctor, met two lovers in the pastures, walking very slowly without converse, one behind the other, as in a funeral procession, and the glimpse that he obtained of their faces seemed to denote that they were anxious and sad. Returning later he passed them again in the same field, progressing just as slowly, and regardless of the hour and of the cheerless night as before. It was only on account of his preoccupation with his own affairs and the illness of his house that he did not bear in mind the curious incident, which, however, he recalled a long while after. During the interval of the cottager's going and coming, she had said to her husband, "'I don't see how I can help being the cause of much misery to you all your life. The river is down there. I can put an end to myself in it. I am not afraid.' I don't wish to add murder to my other foibles," he said. I will leave something to show that I did it myself, on account of my shame. They will not blame you, then. Don't speak so absurdly. I do not wish to hear it. It is nonsense to have such thoughts in this kind of case, which is rather one for satirical laughter than for tragedy. You don't in the least understand the quality of the mishap. It would be viewed in the light of a joke by nine-tenths of the world, if it were known. Please oblige me by returning to the house and going to bed." "'I will,' she said dutifully. They had rambled round by the road which led to the well-known ruins of the Cistercian Abbey behind the mill, the latter having, in centuries past, been attached to the monastic establishment. The mill still worked on, food being a perennial necessity. The abbey had perished, creeds being transient. One continually sees the ministration of the temporary outlasting the ministration of the eternal. Their walk having been circuitous, they were still not far from the house, and in obeying his direction she only had to reach the large stone bridge across the main river and follow the road for a few yards. When she got back everything remained as she had left it, the fire being still burning. She did not stay downstairs for more than a minute, but proceeded to her chamber, whither the luggage had been taken. Here she sat down on the edge of the bed, looking blankly around, and presently began to undress. In removing the light towards the bedstead, its rays fell upon the tester of white dimity. Something was hanging beneath it, and she lifted the candle to see what it was. A bough of mistletoe. Angel had put it there, she knew that in an instant. This was the explanation of that mysterious parcel which had been so difficult to pack and bring, whose contents he would not explain to her, saying that time would soon show her the purpose thereof. In his zest and his gaiety he had hung it there. How foolish and inopportune that mistletoe looked now! Having nothing more to fear, Having scarce anything to hope, for that he would relent there seemed no promise whatever, she lay down dully. When sorrow ceases to be speculative, sleep sees her opportunity. Among so many happier moods which forbid repose, this was a mood which welcomed it, and in a few minutes the lonely Tess forgot existence surrounded by the aromatic stillness of the chamber that had once, possibly, been the bride-chamber of her own ancestry. Later on that night Clare also retraced his steps to the house. Entering softly to the sitting-room he obtained a light, and with the manner of one who had considered his course he spread his rugs upon the old horsehair sofa which stood there, and roughly shaped it to a sleeping couch. 
Before lying down he crept shoeless upstairs, and listened at the door of her apartment. Her measured breathing told that she was sleeping profoundly. "'Thank God!' murmured Clare, and yet he was conscious of a pang of bitterness at the thought, approximately true, though not wholly so, that having shifted the burden of her life to his shoulders, she was now reposing without care. He turned away to descend, then, irresolute, faced round to her door again. In the act he caught sight of one of the d'Urberville dames, whose portrait was immediately over the entrance to Tess's bedchamber. In the candlelight the painting was more than unpleasant. Sinister design lurked in the woman's features, a concentrated purpose of revenge on the other sex, so it seemed to him then. The Caroline bodice of the portrait was low, precisely as Tessis had been when he tucked it in to show the necklace, and again he experienced the distressing sensation of a resemblance between them. The check was sufficient. He resumed his retreat and descended. His air remained calm and cold, his small compressed mouth indexing his powers of self-control his face wearing still that terrible, sterile expression which had spread thereupon since her disclosure. It was the face of a man who was no longer passion's slave, yet who found no advantage in his enfranchisement. He was simply regarding the harrowing contingencies of human experience, the unexpectedness of things. Nothing so pure, so sweet, so virginal as Tess had seemed possible all the long while that he had adored her, up to an hour ago, but the little less and what worlds away. He argued erroneously when he said to himself that her heart was not indexed in the honest freshness of her face, but Tess had no advocate to set him right. Could it be possible, he continued, that eyes which as they gazed never expressed any divergence from what the tongue was telling, were yet ever seeing another world behind her ostensible one, discordant and contrasting. He reclined on his couch in the sitting-room and extinguished the light. The night came in and took up its place there, unconcerned and indifferent, the night which had already swallowed up his happiness, and was now digesting it listlessly and was ready to swallow up the happiness of a thousand other people with as little disturbance or change of mien. End of chapter 35